From the Sky News Centre, this is Paul Murray Live. Thank you, Sherry. All the best to you and your family. Now, youth crime. Let's get back to this issue. Youth crime in Queensland in particular is a huge problem. It was papered over at the last election because the Premier kept everyone safe from the woo-flu coming up from the evil part of New South Wales called Tweed Heads. But as you know, this thing has got worse. There isn't a day where there's a story, there's not a week where there's not a horrible example of it and barely a month goes by without there being something that we never thought we'd see with our own eyes in our own country, let alone the beautiful state of Queensland. People have got story after story about how terrible this thing is and it will drive their vote at the next state election. When this particular animal stabbed my wife, right, he stabbed four of us in the heart. I get the fear. I fear. The first night, I could not sleep. I didn't know if they were going to turn up here. Toowoomba, three break-ins. And we're now living in fear because we've just got to do whatever we can to make sure they go next door. And remember, we went to Toowoomba because this was one of the many epicentres of places that were were dealing with things that people just have had enough of. Now, we all get it. Crime is part, sadly, of life, and sadly, it's part of a modern life. And people, of course, use crime to fuel a whole bunch of things, but mainly, of course, to pay for drugs, and drugs continue to be a scourge on the community. But the Premier of Queensland may well talk some talk, but he doesn't walk the walk. You can never forget him laughing when being asked about youth crime. That's literally the question he was asked, but then we were told, no, your eyes are deceiving you. He definitely wasn't laughing about the question that he was asked, which was about youth crime. And the people of Queensland seem to have had enough of this government telling them lies, going soft and just being in the wrong place all the time when it comes to youth crime. Latest polling suggests that uh, the opposition should win the upcoming state election, but if there is one thing the Queensland Labor Party is good at, it is winning elections, including ones they don't deserve to win. People told pollsters to the Courier Mail about whether they felt safe or not, And 56% of people in regional Queensland did not feel safe in their home or in their community. 66% of people believe that the Palaszczuk and Miles government have been too soft on youth offenders. So who's laughing now? Now, again, Miles thinks that he's able to change the subject, to pretend that we're doing something, we're not doing something, not showing any real urgency about it because... He's part of a certain breed of politician. And politicians have always been about power, but he's of a particular generation where service delivery is completely secondary to the main goal. And that's just keeping your team in power, feeding the machine that is the union base, making sure that they're able to have special advantages in the electoral system, making sure that... If you're part of a union, you get paid differently than people that aren't part of unions. Also, eventually, you create a scenario where, just like with Daniel Andrews, that you've got big business who want to deal with big unions, big business who want to deal with big government, big government who wants hundreds of thousands of people to work for it, or big government that has millions of people reliant on a handout. And somewhere between there, you can build a shape of about 60% of the electorate that will always back in Team Red, regardless of how bad it is. And it takes election after election and the best part of 10 years for now, some light towards the end of the tunnel. But we've seen this light before. We've felt this light before. But I wanted to give you an idea about just how craven the political class is in parts of Queensland about this particular issue. Now, remember, there was the first version of youth crime where, on the very day that the former Premier, Anastasia Palaszczuk, was pretending to talk tough, she also approved, effectively, the decriminalisation of possession of drugs charges. And about 10% of youth crime at that point in time 
were turning up as criminal offences and suddenly by reclassifying these things as not being criminal offences anymore because it's about health and harm minimisation. Now, sure, the crime still exists to pay for it, but if the end bit you can somehow push over to the other part of the ledger, then somehow it doesn't count anymore and youth crime would fall by 10%. The reality is that you knew it, I knew it, we picked it from moment one. But the crime still continues. The idea that stable is OK, a little bit up, a little bit down, it's all sort of statistics. But one of the reasons people care about crime is because when it happens to you, it changes you forever. Now, depending on the severity of the crime that is committed against you or a family member, the depths of that effect are obvious. But if you're somebody who has woken up in the middle of the night to find somebody at the end of your bed, somebody who's been inside their house as the door's been bashed in, someone who's been physically bashed by someone, somebody who's seen a gun, seen a knife, you name it. It changes you. And that's why crime is not statistics, it is about reality and it's about the reality of life for people. But for the Queensland Labor Party, what this is, is a problem. And it's not a problem because its citizens are being attacked. It is not a problem because its citizens' lives are being changed. Its citizens' sense of safety is being changed. It's because it's a threat to them holding on to power. Now, this Labor Party was able to come to power on bashing Campbell Newman. It was able to hold on to power on bashing Campbell Newman. It was able to hold on to power because we kept you safe in Queensland hospitals of a Queensland paintball. But now the reality of their blind spot when it comes to things like crime, because you see in places like Townsville, which just recently changed from the current mayor they have to a brand new mayor, have always sent back lots of Labor MPs. So essentially, the government turns around and says, well, it's not really a problem in the southeast. As long as we can hold on to Townsville, it'll be OK. If we can try and flip a few things around uh, the sunny coast, then we'll be OK. But as you know, the political reality is that from the tippy top to the very bottom, right out west, youth crime and crime in general has now become a major problem and one the government can't get around. So unbelievably... Backbench Labor MPs were sitting on a parliamentary committee were making a whole series of suggestions about how to deal with youth crime. And they had a draft report that suggests censoring the media would be the best way to go here. That you somehow will feel more safe in your house if you don't know what happened on the other side of your suburb. This is an extraordinary story that the Australian had today, where draft recommendations put forward by Labor MPs on a powerful parliamentary committee tackling spiral juvenile justice suggests greater regulation on media reporting. The draft version of the report seen by the Australian recommends that the state government look at the impact of media and social media reporting of crime and any impacts it may have on encouraging offenders, reducing community safety and perceptions of safety so, again, it's not about even the reality of the situation and any impacts on the delivery of victim support. Some members considered that greater regulation of traditional news media could assist in preventing the glorification of young offenders, which can encourage their peers to offend. Now, let me be very clear what all of that code and all of that garbage actually is. All of that would be that we can't show you youth crime. You can't stop people talking about it. You can't stop victims talking about it. But somehow they would create a scenario where in the state of Queensland you would not be able to show the footage that you've seen tonight or the stuff that you know is on your television all the time because it's happening all the time. Every time we go to Queensland, for the show and every time I go in my real life, and you know, if I could have the blood transfusions to be a Queenslander, I would. That's how much I love the joint. 
It doesn't matter which way you think people vote. People just voluntarily start telling stories about what happened to them, what happened to their neighbour, something that they know. But the idea that any government in Australia would be trying to turn around and in the same breath say, look, Crim shouldn't be able to post things to social media because it, uh, it glorifies them. And then in the same breath turn around and say that the TV news shouldn't show you what actually happened because they're one in the same. No. It's about a government trying to twist statistics by reclassifying up to 10% of youth crime being drug offences, magically making them disappear. If you can then censor the footage of anything that didn't happen to you, then you get to fiddle around with the statistics, come out and say, oh, I don't know why anyone has a perception of crime. Look at how low they are. We're the government. We're here to help. Now, this is an outrage. Now, parliamentary committees in Queensland are only of the lower house because there is no upper house. As soon as the government has a majority in the parliament, they basically run roughshod over the whole process. And minor parties are either necessary to keep them in government or they can sit at the end and the back of the bus. The opposition can operate on the smell of an oily rag while the government itself and the ministers and the Labor are bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes this Godzilla-like creature that can't be defeated by normal people. Well, one of the LNP members of parliament who was on the committee responding to the madness of this idea that somehow the best thing for the people of Queensland is not to know what is happening in Queensland. They want to control the recommendations, they want to control the narrative, and guess what? They want to control the media too. Now, only because of the reporting of the Australian newspaper and only because the noise was caught before it could become a recommendation, before it could become a law and before it could get shoved through at five minutes to midnight in the lead-up to an election. The Premier has come out today and said, oh, this, this idea would never happen. Not at all, despite the fact it comes from his own government. And if there's one thing that everyone knows about a Labor government, the people at the very top or the people who work for the people at the very top know everything that is happening including when you set up an inquiry that you end up in charge of. And remember, no government in the country has ever set up an inquiry unless they knew what the outcome of the inquiry was going to be. They wanted to do this. They wanted to censor the media's ability to tell you what's going on because it hurts their political chances. And caught red-hot and red-handed, the Premier now pretends, oh, nothing to see here. Well, we have no intention of doing that. Would the, you agree? What I've in, no. Uh, what I've indicated, in fact, is that we will provide media with greater access to the courts, that we do want to see uh, ongoing scrutiny of our institutions. Again, let me take my time here. The slipperiness of this, oh, we want a, a greater access to the courts, that's not what the conversation was. The potential recommendation and the idea being suggested by his own Labor MPs was that the media should be censored that censoring would mean what we can talk about, how we can talk about it and what we can show you. Yet he pretends none of that is on the table, none of that's even been an idea. Instead, greater access to children's courts somehow is the only thing you should be paying attention to. Now, there is a horrible trend inside this Labor government and the people who work for it which when you have been the party in power, with the exception of the three years of Campbell Newman, for the best part of 30 years, exactly the same as the uh, Bailieu and Napthon leaderships in Victoria. Essentially, you've been in charge for 30 years. Everyone from the doorman at State Parliament all the way through to the presiding officer and the Premier ends up just expecting things to be that the Labor Party is in charge. And the Labor Party has form. Have a look at this. In Queensland, this term. Queensland Health pushes for new laws to stop journalists on reporting failures and to charge whistleblowers that expose the failures of the health system. Before the last election, 
the health the uh, attorney general who became the health minister, who's now the attorney general again, wanted to introduce laws that would make it illegal for me to tell you on television or anyone on 4BC or anyone in the Brisbane Times or anyone in the Courier Mail that if a candidate for election was being investigated or had allegations currently before the Corruption Commission, you were not allowed to talk about that. Again, because they were caught red-handed, it didn't happen. Now, if they keep doing this, it's a pattern, and they have kept doing this. Yet these are the people who will, of course, make out that their political opponents are the threat to democracy. And unbelievably, the federal government is using the events of this week to make the same point. I have spoken relentlessly about how this government's plan, under the cover of misinformation laws, is to censor the internet from the things they do not want you to see. Often the things that are the calling out of what they do, about how they administer government. This is a government that's getting people looking at draft legislation to sign non-disclosure agreements. And now Michelle Rowland, the communications minister, is out and about suggesting that the misinformation laws are needed more than ever. Why? Because of the dangerous falsehoods that were being pushed around on social media after the church stabbing the other night. No. The laws that she is trying to introduce and her government is trying to slip through to the keeper. They pretend that it's all about going after the rogue lunatics on the internet. But what it really is because they will not show us what the draft legislation is. Because, of course, to see the draft legislation, you'd have to sign an NDA, wouldn't you? What it is, is to go after the social media companies for spreading misinformation. Now, this government itself said that much of the information that was put forward by the No campaign, that appeared in places like Sky News Primetime and in lots of other places, was misinformation. So, therefore, programs like mine Interviews like the ones we do here, YouTube videos, posts on skynews.com.au that you forward on to somebody else would be an example of the sort of stuff that's going to get whack a mould here. And who makes the decision? A bunch of people who work for the Communications and Media Authority who, last time I checked, are part of the same bureaucracy that doesn't watch us. Instead, they turn around and hear what the narrative is that gets built about us via shows like Media Watch or the fingers that get pointed at us via social media. Yet these people would have the opportunity to turn around and tell you what you can post and what news sources you're allowed to watch and believe in and tell your friends about. In Queensland, they want to stop you knowing what is happening in Queensland. In Canberra, they want to stop you being able to hear from anyone who disagrees with what they are doing. And it is a disgrace that anyone would suggest that the events of the past seven days and the trauma of the past seven days would be a reason why we need to censor the internet about news. Now, I have avoided, like the plague, for years, anything to do with Bruce Lerman or Brittany Higgins. Because who cares? Not about the central claim, as I said on day one, the night that the project went to air. It's a matter for the police to be adjudicated. I sat silently as we saw the ACT process go up and down and fall apart. I've said nothing about all of the different tangents and all the rest of it. We were on breaking news the other night, so I couldn't speak about the fact that the justice had said very clearly on, on the balance of probabilities that Bruce Lerman had raped Brittany Higgins. But I've got to take 30 seconds to tell you that Chris Kenny on his program tonight did a surgical job of pulling apart the political disgrace and weaponisation of this matter that should have always been dealt with by the police, this matter that has been held up by the justice as a rape. Instead, the who knew what and when, the Canberra Colombo of it all, was where we spent much of 
all of this. And there was a very definite turn in the polls from when all of this issue started being asked about and who knew what and who knew when and all the protests. And then we ended up in the result that we did at the last federal election. Now, whether the government was always going to end up in that place or not, who knows? Probably. They were going for a fourth term. But, of course, the Justice, when he was giving uh, his summation, his uh, statement, his ruling, he was pretty absolute, which was that much of the political stuff was garbage. Now, you remember the types of stuff the Labor Party sort of particularly ripped into Linda Reynolds about when it came to Brittany Higgins and how she was treated in the office when, of course... Brittany Higgins had made a decision for a couple of years uh, that she didn't want to go where she ended up going, which was uh, police in a courtroom. The Prime Minister already... refuses to answer a question in the Parliament. Let's Ms. be clear, it is part of a cover-up and yeah. a deferral of being clear with the Parliament. These matters go to the conduct of this minister. When did she know? What did she do? How did she respond? But as you know, and again, Chris Kennedy did a far more surgical job, as have my other colleagues, but Chris's in particular tonight was pretty stunning. It's up at skynews.com.au. Justice Lee blew a giant hole in all of the politics that we have been trudging through for the past couple of years as the people who are now in office took the lowest road to get there. When examined properly and without partiality, the cover-up allegation was objectively short on facts, but long on speculation and internal inconsistencies. Trying to particularise it during the evidence was like trying to grab a column of smoke. But despite its logical and evidentiary flaws, Ms Higgins' boyfriend selected and then contacted two journalists and then Ms Higgins advanced her account to them and through them to others. From the first moment, the cover-up component was promoted and recognised as the most important part of the narrative. The various controversies traceable to its publication resulted in the legal challenge of determining what happened late one night in 2019 becoming much more difficult than otherwise would be the case. Well, of course, one of the chief accusers was Katie Gallagher. And Katie Gallagher was all very up there with Penny Wong and Christina Keneally at the time and all very indignant and all about cover-up, 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 cover-up. And what sends me crazy about Katie Gallagher as an example of the modern politician, she was caught lying to the Senate about what she knew, yet she keeps her job, but we're the new government that's all about transparency and honesty. She's also now had basically the entirety of the political argument blown away by a bloke who had more evidence than any reporter or television or that anyone had to look at all of the angles, and he decided to make a comment about this while adjudicating the truth defence of Network 10. And Katie Gallagher was on with Kieran Gilbert today, and these people are shameless. And while that's all very well and good if you're trying to defend yourself endlessly politically, it is not a great sign about people who are self-aware enough to know when they've made a mistake. And she didn't just make a mistake, she led a charge which very it effectively worked. They're in power. The people they were questioning are not in power. This moved the needle. But when a judge turns around and says that kind of not a lot in there, wrestling smoke, you would think that she would at least be slightly chastened. Instead, nah, I'm awesome. I mark my own homework and I give myself 10 out of 10. Would you consider that? Will you apologise? Uh, Kieran, I asked reasonable questions of the minister whose office was involved in what has been found to have been a rape against an employee within that office, um, and I have nothing further to add on that. Well, then, let's just simply move on. This government, when it comes to the economy, will try to tell you what you know is not true. Uh, because, of course, they're still going to have a federal budget surplus in a few weeks' time. And all the people in Canberra will go, oh, fantastic, and the Canberra bubble, oh, they're managing the economy so well. Despite the fact there's a per capita recession, despite the fact the Australian dollar means that it is a lot more expensive to import things into the country and caused by the Prime Minister's own admissions, we don't make stuff in the country anymore, all of that's going to cost a lot more money. 
Today, unemployment up as a football stadium of people lost a job in the part-time sector and a slightly smaller football stadium was made up of people who ended up getting a full-time job. The result was 7,000 extra people go onto the dole queues. The International Monetary Fund is saying that Australia is going to be lagging its peers when it comes to lowering inflation. And remember, until inflation gets between 2 and 3%, the Reserve Bank will continue to either increase interest rates or most likely just leave them where they currently are, where you have to find somewhere between 15 and over $30,000 more than you did before this government came to, elect uh, to be elected to pay off your mortgage. Oh, yeah, and business insolvencies, they've now hit record numbers. But that's OK. We've got the Greens waving their fingers at the CEOs of supermarkets. That'll make everything OK, won't it? Banducci, honestly, I'm, I'm not interested in your spin or your bull****. This is a Senate inquiry. Answer the question. Well, guess what? The expectation is that despite all the bluster, all the carry-on, the show trial, the preview of the show trial, nothing's going to happen. There'll be no changes when it comes to the cost of goods because the cost of goods has a lot more to do than just the CEO of Coles or Woolworths walking around aisle by aisle just going, yeah, let's put that up by 20 cents, put that up by a dollar. It's a little more complicated, including business that has to pay more money because of the decisions made by this government. And every night, about this time, we get ready for Donald Trump to turn up to court yet again. Jury selection slowly but surely making its way through. They've got, uh, I think, about eight of the 16 people that they need, 12 for a normal jury plus six alternates. Apparently, both the defence and prosecution have already used six of their ten automatic, you know, I don't like jury number four, you can bugger off. So things are starting to get tight. The expectations are we may well end up with a jury in the next uh, week or so, but probably even faster than that. But one thing that we had fun with with Megyn Kelly on the show last night was just how sort of Mills and Boone and how saucy, sort of love, hate, love, hate, I love you, don't, I love you, I love you or not, look at me, don't look at me. All of the f coverage can be sometimes about Donald Trump in literally every one of his bodily gestures, movements, breaths or what's happening with his uh, eyelids. Well, Megyn decided to take it to a whole new level and this is some of the most awesome things I've ever seen, which is basically... Her reading word for word what was actually in the descriptions of supposedly important journalists and, you know, democracy dies in darkness and freedom of the press and all the rest of that business, were writing about Donald Trump when he was in the courtroom. Turn the lights down, light a candle and enjoy. <clears throat> Quote. Trump appeared to close his eyes and tilt his head from side to side. He then removed a paper from his breast pocket and started examining it." End quote. His eyes closed, you say? Head tilting back, writhing from side to side? Did you mention a breast? Go on. Quote, Trump at one point looked at something on his lawyer's phone. Later, Trump's eyes closed again and his head occasionally dipped slowly. Yes, Isaac, yes! The romance continues. The New York Times tells us, Trump shifted around in his seat and whispered to his lawyer. A moment ago, it reported, he looked bored, but now he's engaged. Oh yeah, he's into it, don't stop! He's engaged! And then, as the love god used to say on the radio, mm, more please, Megan, more. Trump is sitting at the defense table as his attorneys whisper in his ear. One attorney, Frank tells us, twice referred to when Trump lost his election. Lost his what? Now, Frank continues, Trump's head slowly dropped. His eyes closed. It jerked back upward. He adjusts himself. What? Then his head droops again. He straightens up, leaning back. His head droops for a third time. He shakes his shoulders. Eyes closed still. His head drops. <laughs> How good is she? 
<laughs> she is the best. Megan Kelly with us each and every Wednesday. You can find her on YouTube or Sirius XM. Quick break. Back with more No Sooks, No Lefties this Thursday night. Michael Kroger, Bromwood Bishop here. And we're going to talk about how China is telling us we're not allowed to defend ourselves against China. More in a moment here on Sky News on a Thursday night. One for lovers. That's breaking news for you, uh, which is an add-on to what we assumed would be taking place, which is in relation to the uh, stabbing that took place earlier in the week. The 16-year-old, or a 16-year-old boy, I should say, has been charged, and I'm reading directly here from a police statement, that a 16-year-old boy has been charged with terror terrorism offences today following an investigation by the Joint Counter-Terror Team in Sydney into an alleged stabbing at a Sydney church. This afternoon, investigators from the Joint Counter-Terrorism Team, Sydney, attended a medical facility to interview the boy before he was charged with committing a terrorist act under Section 101.1 of the Criminal Code Act of the Commonwealth from 1995, an offence which carries a maximum penalty of imprisonment for life. He has been refused bail and is expected to, be, uh, to appear before a bedside court hearing tomorrow. So, 16-year-old uh, who police had been waiting to speak to, they ended up speaking to him uh, and has now been charged. Uh, further proceedings will take place tomorrow. No sooks now left is this Thursday night and, of course, none other than the carryover champ. The wonderful Bronwyn Bishop is here, along with the wonderful Michael Kroger. Lovely to see you both. Now, there's a lot to get to, but let's try to pick our best ofs here, right? Um, so, China tells us off for spending more money trying to defend ourselves against China. Amazingly, Richard Miles, the bloke who handed over his speeches to China before he gave them, uh, says that one of the reasons they're moving never-never years and never-never money around is again to combat China. What's really going on here? Well, the speech was a pee and thimble, wasn't it? It was, this is the most dangerous time we're going into, uh, and we're going to put all this money into us because China's a bad guy, but guess what? We're not going to put most of the money in, 90% of the money in, until way past the forward estimates when they've been out of office, Thank, hopefully, hopefully, for a long time. <laughs> I mean, it, it is... Seriously, in the meantime, they've cut $72 billion worth of, of already allocated spending. Wouldn't tell us where that money is. And then they get it out of the, the dropkick sidekick who uh, counts for $40 billion. So where's the other $31 billion? Mm. Oh, um, classified. Yeah. I mean, seriously, what sort of defence minister is this? But what about this scenario where, again, uh, on the one hand, this is the, the great Penny Wong and the great Prime Minister managing the relationship, and presumably, according to China, the, the, the Richard Miles is now screwing it all up? When I listen to Penny Wong... And I heard, when I heard her speak about the two-state solution and what Australia was going to do, I was asking myself, who is the Prime Minister? Mm. Is this a joint, uh, joint venture between uh, Albanese and her? Um, do they play games to exclude this one this time, set this one up? Oh, look, we're really pro the US and we're really anti-China, but in the meantime, we're really cuddling up like there's no tomorrow. I mean, seriously. And what about Aspie? They're going to review its funding. Yep. That was one of the demands that the Chinese made, that they should be scrubbed because they criticised China. They are happy to be the heads of a vassal state. That's the only conclusion I can come to, where they will be licking, kissing the hand that flicks the whip. Well, but also, Michael, are we supposed to believe that the same people who don't have the courage to look the President of China in the eye and say, hey, about you guys sonaring our, our, our Navy divers, that this is also the government that's going to somehow buy all the stuff to take on China should they come our way? Mm -hmm. Mate, it's very hard to know. I, I must admit to being a bit confused tonight by the Chinese. Um, maybe it's my advancing years and, and you can help me. I don't want to misquote... Sorry to read from my phone, but I don't want to misquote the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Lin Wan. Uh, this is what he said. I've got to get this right, Paul. China is committed to peaceful development and a national defence po defense policy that is defensive in nature. We stay committed to the peace and stability in the Asian Pacific region and the wider world and pose no threat to any country. Well, that's what he said. 
Oh, Martin, you got it right. Then, then, but then, hang on. Bronwyn, the reason I'm confused is CNN then have got a report saying China is helping Russia ramp up its defence industrial base at such a large scale that Moscow is now undertaking its most ambitious expansion in military manufacturing since the Soviet era as it continues its war against Ukraine. Uh, the, China, the, the support China is providing includes machine tools, drones, turbojet engines and technology for cruise missiles... Um, which Russia used to make propellants for weapons, said the officials. So either Mr One was <laughs> ill-informed himself <laughs> and overlooked the fact that the Chinese are supplying all these weapons and weaponry to Russia for its war against Ukraine, or he's just a horrid liar like most many most uh, spokespeople for toxic uh, repressive dictatorial communist regimes like the Chinese government is. So, mm. no, you can't believe a word he says. And mm -hmm. um, the Australian government should be doing a lot more and, as Bronwyn said, should be doing a lot quicker than a 10-year forward estimate spending. But, Michael, on that, that piece you just read out, there is an explanation. It was just a misspelling on the, interp uh, on the translation. Of course they want peace. <laughs> they want a peace of Europe and they, they want do. a peace of America and they want a peace of the Pacific <laughs> Island and a peace of Australia. They hey, want peace Bronny, in Bronny, bucket loads. Bronnie, he made, he made it very clear, if you don't believe the spokesman, he made it very clear. Very China poses no threat. He po China poses no threat to anyone in the Asia-Pacific region, yeah. Um, yeah, like Taiwan. There's no, no cyber threat security. At all to They're Taiwan. not building the, islands the, anywhere. No, nothing. No, 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 no. And not only that. No, no. Their aim. No, he's made that very clear. And not only that, their aim is the sort of war that you don't need to go in with the uh, the battleships or uh, the great armaments, but if you can control our source of power. You can knock it out a city at a time and say, well, unless you do what we want, uh, we will knock it all out. Mm. So uh, why aren't we watching what comes in from China? We wouldn't let Huawei in to do our uh, telecommunications system. Mm. What do you think they might be putting in the windmills and the solar panels? Well, this is it. I mean... It's all coming from China, and despite Arvo says, oh, we're going to stop that, we're going to give a billion dollars to a billionaire <laughs> and, a, and an ex-prime minister so they can mm. build solar panels here, which will beat the whole cost of it. And furthermore, we're going to manufacture in Australia everything by giving subsidies to, uh, to uh, businesses mm. that are going to build green energy stuff. Yeah. In the meantime... The plastics the manufacturer. The plastic manufacturer, <laughs> which is essential for this country, Correct. is allowed to, to collapse... Belonging to a Chinese? Yeah. Yes. Correct. All right. I want to talk about uh, mm. the Teals who are out there trying to scare liberals about just how many seats after, you know, one and then the high water mark of 2022 and now because they're the, you know, the hot new thing, they'll take over up to 25 potential seats. The, uh, the money group behind it uh, and, of course, its chief backer, Climate 200, put out a list today of the seats that they're going to be targeting. Uh, and apparently it's going to be... Um, very small margins like Deakin and Moore um, for the Liberal Party. Casey Dixon, oh, that'd be Peter Dutton's electorate. Uh, Monash, Wannan, Bradfield, where the teal, who wasn't really a teal last time, has pretended she's the MP for the past two years. Uh, no psychological warfare there. Uh, Durack, Forrest, uh, Farrah, Groom, McPherson, Cowper, Nichols, Collaire where Edward G's already uh, sort of an independent because he was kind of scared of the teals last time. Oh, but they are taking on two... Labor seats, Michael, and they're uh, the seat of Bean mm. and Franklin, where the current margin of the sitting MP is 12.9% and 13.7%. Mm. So they're running against Labor people that mm. they have no chance of, of, of beating. Instead, Labor Party preferences, they hope, will get them up and over the line. And, of course, it's mm. all about changing the political system by basically just wiping out the Liberal Party. That said, while we could yeah. go on a teal bashathon right now, how do you fight them? How do you push back? Because a long list is meant to scare Liberals. So, mate, I think the Teals reached their high watermark in 2022. I don't think they'll win any more seats. I don't think they'll win one more, apart from the ones they've got, a couple of which are at risk. Uh, the one in Western Australia, um, and take your pick of several of the others. 
but the issues they ran on, which is basically anti, in the whole anti-Scott Morrison narrative, which gained them quite a lot of support, the anti-Liberal Party narrative, the same, uh, the anti-corruption commission, which has now been implemented. No doubt they'll be looking at the $2.4 million yeah. payment soon. Uh, and global warming, which the Albanese government's, um, you know, apparently doing a lot about. So the issues that the Teal campaigned on in 2022 are no longer as, as, as poignant as they were then. And secondly, I think overwhelmingly people have been disappointed with the performance of the Teals. I mean, they haven't achieved much at all. Uh, you can't, when you're a single vote or even a, a block of votes in the lower house where you don't really affect the numbers. So, so I think generally people are looking at the Teals saying, well, that was a bit of a waste of time. I mean, the fact that we swapped Josh Frydenberg uh, out of Kuyong, um for, for a Teal who's, who's really achieved nothing, um, Ryan. Um, same, same in Goldstein. They got rid of Tim, Tim Wilson and, and, and got a Teal in, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think they'll win any more. Uh, and as I said, I think they're at risk in quite a number. The Liberal Party, like I say all the time, you have to stand for something. You have to, you have to powerfully... Uh, you know, have a position on, on the major issues facing the country, not be afraid of making enemies, have courage. Uh, I might say exactly what Dutton's been doing. I think Dutton's been mm. sterling as leader of the Liberal Party. He's united the place. Uh, he's come out forcefully on major issues like The Voice, nuclear energy. You've got to give your troops something to rally behind. You've got to inspire your base. Um, you know, the Greens inspire all the nutbags out there to support them. Uh, you know, you, you need to give something. You need to give food. You need to feed your base and, and, and the electorate generally. So a more powerful Liberal Party standing for something very important will will probably win a few of those teal seats back. And as I said, I can't see them winning anymore. Well, and of course, interestingly, um, we've seen, you know, the polling that came out of the Financial Review uh, this week about uh, rising concerns in and around crime. Obviously, we know where we've been this week. Uh, and there's, uh, yeah, pretty strong uh, divided line and a difference between uh, a Prime Minister who's, you know, still thinking it's an election campaign and an announcement every day trying to reassure the country about sort of uh, um, social tensions while wearing hard hats and high vis as opposed to actually spending the week. He didn't want to be blown off course from whatever the message of it was, which, of course, was, among other things, never, never money about taking on China while simultaneously not confronting China. Bromont, sadly, I'm out of time, as well as mm. wonderful Michael. We'll see you again next week. All right, the great Nigel Farage stands by. Now, he was putting together and he was part of a big conference, which was about freedom lovers having a, a conversation, but the local mayor tried to shut it all down. Where have we seen this before? More in a sec. Nigel Farage was able to, uh, well, put a stick in the establishment's eye when it came to Brexit and has never stopped since. And he was doing it for a long time in the European Parliament. And he was part of a conference which was being set up uh, this week, yet it was essentially disrupted, if not closed down completely, on its first day. It got back up and running in Brussels on its uh, second day, and Nigel joins us now from London. Under what pretence was the apparent shutting down of a bunch of centre-right people? Uh, why was it shut down by the Mayor of Brussels? The first venue we booked withdrew on us after threats. The second venue we booked withdrew on us after threats. And by the way, these threats coming from elected mayors. Wow. saying, if you host these people, we will, we will destroy your business. The third venue, a nightclub owned by a Tunisian businessman who wasn't even a conservative himself, but said he believed in free speech. They towed away his car. They stopped the caterers coming into the building. They threatened to ruin his business, and he held firm. The cops turned up whilst I was on the stage, and I did say to them, if you want me out of here, you're going to have to drag me out. Um, and they sort of lost their nerve and locked the building down. And, and um, overnight, we won a victory in the High Court in Belgium. We got the support of the British Prime Minister, the Italian Prime Minister. We got the support of the Belgian Prime Minister. And, of course, the next day, the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, shared the platform. And do you know something? I spent many years in Brussels. I was banned from pubs, restaurants, coffee bars. That's real cancel culture. It's rather like communism. If you disagree with the globalist project of ever closer political union, you're mad, bad and dangerous. So I'd seen this on a personal level against myself. Now the whole world has seen what this place is like, 
what this mentality is. And we've had big stuff in America on Fox News, New York Times, you name it. And I tell you something, this has now turned into a gigantic victory for free speech. And I think it might mark something of a watershed. Yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, certainly you remember your experience in Australia where you book an event, people can buy a ticket if they yeah. want to, but the people who disagree with you politically promise to pick it and carry on. So you get sent the bill. Right, this, rather than the bill being sent to the protester, you get sent the bill. So this stuff is international, it's multifaceted, multi-leveled. Um, and the mayor of Brussels, oh, it's all about making sure that, you know, I, I want to keep people safe because they're trying to uh, keep people safe against the counter-protests. The, the cancel culture side of it is so absolute for people to understand that uh, we're not talking about somebody not being able to have a television show, we're talking about elected members of parliament not being allowed to gather in a coffee shop in Belgium. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you're right. And, and, of course, this conference, I mean, you couldn't meet a more peaceable group of people. We have members of European royal families, the Prime Minister of Hungary, um, you know, academics, businessmen and women. All right, Nigel Farage was there. I know he's the oh. devil. But, you know, generally, generally a very peaceful bunch. Um, and even the counter-protest was about five losers. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so you're quite right. You're quite right. I mean... You know, I myself was a victim of the New South Wales police protection racket. Um, so, yeah, there's a big lesson being learned in Brussels, and let's hope it's learned in America, the rest of Europe, and indeed in Australia too. I, honestly, Paul, I feel that what's happened in the last 48 hours is actually really good news for free speech. We've won a mm. famous victory. So, out, out of interest, was the Labor Party able to skip it in the UK because they're not the party of government? Or have you seen people who would disagree with every fibre of your uh, political existence saying, yeah, but he has a right to say something? The only people, really, not to come out and condemn... What, what they attempted to do to me whilst I was on stage in the whole conference has been the British Labour Party, wow. who apparently think that a terrible group of people were about to gather. And that shows you that when Mr Starmer becomes, or Sakir becomes, our Prime Minister, which he will later on this year, um, we're headed into a new period of Cromwellian Puritanism where only certain views will be tolerated. So we don't have too much to look forward to, do we? No, not quite. Uh, have you been keeping up with not much happening in the Trump trials, but still an awful lot of media hype? He has to sit there all day, every day, the rolling coverage. Uh, and I noticed that on MSNBC, one of their hosts actually came out and kind of admitted him having to sit there um, through the process is part of the punishment. This is a bloke who obviously has been bouncing all over the place, high-level decision-making, you know, every 30 seconds something else to do, to sit and look forward as they slowly but surely go through a jury questionnaire um, is part of the punishment, and the lefties are loving it. Yeah, and potentially up to six weeks of it. And, and of course, you know, Donald is a sort of guy, he likes to look at something, make an opinion, do we do something, don't we? Let's act, let's go. He's that kind of guy. Very much an instinctive kind of guy. You know, he looks at you, he likes you, or he doesn't like you. Uh, this must be absolute torture for him to go through. Absolute torture. Not even allowed to attend his son Barron's graduation from school. That is how mean-spirited and nasty uh, these judges are. And the whole American judicial system, uh, frankly, has been politicised, corrupted, uh, and looks, I think, truly dreadful to fair-minded Americans and, indeed, to the rest of the world as well. Bloody earth. So good to talk to you, Nigel. We'll see you again in your normal spot next week. In Thank the meantime, you. check him out online. Uh, Lots of examples of his show on GP News. Be great. Back with more here on Paul Murray Live. All right, late debate in a moment or two's time. Before we go, uh, Renmark, South Australia, a couple of Sundays' time. Um, that's where we're bringing the next of our, our towns. It is a magnificent part of Australia. If you would like to join us, feel free. Send me an email, which is ourtown at skynews.com.au. Renmark, South Australia, Sunday the 28th. It's the place that invented cask wine.